So I've been trying to make art for a long time. But it wasn't until recently that I realized I've never made a thing in my entire life. This pencil, for example, is almost invisible to us because it's so ordinary. In my job, I take ordinary things like this and I just rearrange them so that they look differently. I'm not actually making anything. But if you take this pencil and you remove the graphite from it and just rearrange the graphite, it can look like this. If you rearrange it in a different way, it can also look like this. It's the same graphite, it's just been rearranged. I have to admit that I never had much use for art. <laughs> I never called myself an artist. I actually thought it was kind of frivolous and decorative and I really didn't have much interest. Another confession, I kind of thought artists were pretentious and operated in privileged spaces like art galleries. And I had much more serious interests. I was interested in how poverty affects communities and geopolitical violence and the evils of capitalism, unpretentious things like that. <laughs> then I met Heather and we started dating, we fell in love, we got married, and now I'm giving talks about art. <laughs> in fact, we travel all over the world uh, doing art. And I didn't see that coming. Um, but it's not just any kind of art that we're talking about today. We're talking about something called socially engaged art. And we're going to show you some examples. Here's the first one. So I was sitting in our apartment one day watching the news and I heard the newscaster say that my city had just regained its title as homicide capital of New York State. And I thought, how could that be possible when my life is seemingly unaffected by violent crime? And so I decided that I need to learn more. Using public police reports, I was able to identify the locations for the 54 homicides that happened that year. I bought a map of Rochester and just marked the exact location where each one happened. You can see those with the red dots in the top left-hand corner. I noticed that they were all within a very small section of the city. And of course, it happens to be our lowest socioeconomic level, those neighborhoods in the city. I wondered what would it look like if the homicides were happening in the suburban side of our city? And if they were happening there, what decisions would we make then? And so I traveled to each of those dots. I'd, I'd taken the dots and flipped them onto the suburban side. I then drove to each of those dots and set up a memorial on site. This, for example, is where Makesha Hazard would have been murdered had she been murdered in the suburbs rather than the city. She was a young 16-year-old woman, African-American, killed by a handgun. This is where Frederick Lewis would have been killed had he been killed in the suburbs. Young African-American man, 12 years old, also killed by a handgun. One thing I realized working in public spaces and rather than rearranging graphite, rearranging the real spaces of our lives, one thing I realized that when you're working in those spaces, you also have to be prepared for real life consequences. In this case, for example, a woman called me at work and screamed into the phone for about 45 minutes. And she said things like, I don't want this in my neighborhood. You should be ashamed of yourself. You aren't an artist and this isn't an art project. This is a criminal offense and you're a criminal just like them. Note that she didn't say who she was talking about when she said just like them. And note also that I had only left flowers on the front lawn where five miles away that would have been a dead son or a dead daughter. The homeowner of this house, rather than removing the, the funeral memorial, he came out with a hose before and after work each day to water it. He didn't know exactly what the project was about, but knew it was important to someone, so he wanted to keep it alive. After marking those 54 sites, I started to think, maybe this is unfair. This is an un incomplete project. I'm invading suburban areas, the places where I live and making an assumption, nobody cares, I'm going to leave these here without offering a way for community members to respond. So this is the next project. It's called I Know It Happened and It Happened Like This. 
The idea is that those small memorials that you see on the streets at the real sites of homicides are left by just the closest friends and family members of the victims. But what if the entire community came together and left something in support of those families who have lost loved ones? I started with just putting out an email describing the project, and within a week, over 100 people responded, and our kitchen and basement became absolutely filled with stuffed animals, candles, flowers, and notes of support for those families. And with that, we built a 20-foot mountain of memorial items, both as a beacon of hope and a siren for crisis. In March of 2012, Heather and I had the privilege of traveling to Karachi, Pakistan. And we were invited there to give uh, a lecture on socially engaged art and at a conference called Social Intervention, uh, a, a Better Tomorrow for a Future Generation. And in addition to giving lectures and organizing a community art project in Karachi, uh, we started a student film festival on social issues. These are two of the, the winners of the film festival uh, who won Best of Fest. The young man on the left uh, is from Afghanistan, and it was the first time we'd ever met someone from Afghanistan. While we were there, we were treated, treated with great um, kindness and respect and generosity. We made many friends. We brought home stories about life in Karachi and Pakistan that was very different from the perspectives that we'd seen on TV. And uh, contrary to what we feared that they would hate us, it was actually the opposite. They were more generous and kind uh, than in many places we've been uh, anywhere in the world. But we also brought back a troubling element to our conversations. And we learned uh, while we were there from Pakistani citizens that they had concerns over US military operations in Pakistan. And specifically, they had concerns about US predator drones. And that's something that we didn't really know a whole lot about. But we started looking into it and we learned that over the past nine years that thousands of Pakistani people have been killed and we are not at war with Pakistan. Uh, oftentimes, innocent people are, are killed in the process of us flying drones in, in Pakistan and using missiles. And we thought, that doesn't seem right to us. Uh, so we wanted to pose the question to Americans, how would you feel if drones could be flown over United States airspace by a foreign government and taking out people? How would that feel to you? So what we did, similar to uh, the Suburban Homicide Project, we plotted the location of 344 drone strikes uh, that have taken place uh, by US drones in Pakistan on the left. And on the right, we took those dots and arranged them in Massachusetts and Connecticut. Once again, we wanted to create a fictional scenario that challenged people's perspectives on the use of drone warfare. When we went to the dots on the map, we photographed who and what would have been destroyed on that day had a drone strike taken place. You can see a basketball court, a street, a busy street, a wedding, a yard sale. And the point we wanted to make also was that there could be someone there that was targeted, but think about all the people and things that would have been destroyed uh, if that person was targeted, much like we do in, in Pakistan. We built a model of a drone, uh, an 18 foot, and we covered it in rhinestones to try to make it look beautiful because the way that we're sold this technology is that it's efficient and kills terrorists and, and it's this beautiful technology. But the more you look into it, the more questions it raised for us about the fairness and ethics uh, of using them. And we pointed it at a map of Massachusetts and put the photographs uh, up on the wall of things and people that would have been destroyed. Once again, asking people to consider a different perspective. What if it was you, or what if it was your country, or, or your neighborhood that was being targeted? So we were attempting to range materials in life to ask those questions and get people to think about it. This is another project that I started. Uh, the idea came for it, came way back in 2004 or so. 
when I started to question the decisions that our government was making abroad. And I started to think, do I really want to be represented that way to people living in other countries? Is that really the America that I am and that I believe in and I want to show to other countries? And as the years passed, it felt like it was getting more and the, our, you know, our sensibility of who we wanted to be, I was becoming more and more different from the viewpoint that the government was projecting. So I decided at one point, you know what, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to use my own voice. I'm only one citizen, but maybe, maybe I can use my voice. And I decided to write to every king, queen, president, and prime minister on earth with the message, for example, uh, to honorary prime minister, Sp prime minister Spencer, I'm writing to apologize for the times when the United States government prioritized its economic interest over the needs of humanity. Sincerely, Heather Layton, American citizen. And I made the envelopes crystal clear so that maybe they would get to the leader of the countries, and I did get some responses back. But the more important part for me was that every single person who touched them along the way would be able to read the message inside. I should say that the image up in the top right-hand corner, the, uh, those were all the letters that I sent. I sent 212 of them, so all the countries that are official plus all the countries uh, people who just say their countries, they got them too. <laughs> it's very important to know that we're not doing this alone. This is not just our art that we're making. Socially engaged art has a long history, and it also is right now happening all over the world. There's a huge network of artists who are also rearranging the elements of our everyday lives to make us question, what do we believe in, and where are we? Alfredo Yar is one of those artists, and here in this project, he set up 100,000 watts of red light into the cupola of one of the most impressive government, government buildings in Montreal. He then installed buttons in every homeless shelter within 500 yards of the cupola. Every time a homeless person hit one of those buttons, the cupola would flash in red. And the idea is, how easy is it for us to ignore the problem of homelessness? But how easy is it to keep ignoring it when you're standing under red flashing light? This is another project by Gustavo Artigas. And here, he took basketball teams from San Diego and soccer teams from Tijuana and had the young men play their games on the same court at the same time. <laughs> With the idea that this younger generation, and really all of our generations, you know, we, we should be practicing our own games and involved in our own culture, while at the same time respecting other cultures and making space for other people to practice their own. This last example, Conflict Kitchen, it's a project that was invented by Don Waleski and John Rubin. And they set, it up, uh, set up a takeout restaurant that only serves food from countries that the United States is in conflict with. And here the idea was, you know, sometimes it's hard to have conversations. Sometimes those conversations fall dead when you're talking about the U.S. is in conflict here and in conflict there. They tried to find our commonalities. What are the things that bring us together? And uh, let, let's share that first. Let's share this food. And then by doing that, all the comments on the wrappers uh, held all different types of information about each of the countries. So here, for example, you're seeing Cuba, Afghanistan, Iran, and Venezuela, and I believe that North Korea is up next. And this project, an anonymous group of artists in Tehran staged fake family fights. And so the artists would go out in public, all different ages, all different groups, and would just spontaneously start to argue at a public market or things like that. But the content of their fights was information about discriminatory laws by the Iranian government that you could not talk about otherwise for fear of being jailed. But nobody wants to intervene in a family fight, and so they could argue about it, they gave each, they gave each other 10 minutes, then you had to disperse and meet at another location. So we feel that this idea of socially engaged art is a powerful one that, um, that should be spread. And if we think of our lives not as the graphite in a pencil, but rather the infinite number of possibilities that graphite can become. If we think about ways that we might rearrange the world to see things differently, then the possibilities are endless. Thank you for your time today. <laughs>